Good afternoon, everybody. I am Christy Koenig, and I serve as the EMS Medical Director for the County of San Diego. We welcome today uh, your attendance at the Base Station Physicians Committee Evidence-Based Medicine presentation. And we are thrilled today to welcome Dr. Lori Daniels, who is a professor of medicine and cardiologist at the University of California, San Diego, where she serves as medical director of the Cardiovascular Intensive Care Unit. Dr. Daniels will be speaking to us today on a very important topic, ACS in women. So thank you so much, Dr. Daniels, for joining us. My pleasure. Good to be here. And I'm going to share my screen real quickly here. So here we go. Like you said, um, I know this is a very sophisticated audience. So, um, you know, I think it's hard for me to see questions, but maybe at the end we'll have time for that or, or you'll have to chime in and interrupt me because I can't actually see the, the chat too well here. Uh, let me see if I can hide the video panel. Okay. Um, so, you know, heart disease in women and acute coronary syndrome um, specifically, as you, as you guys know, Heart disease is the number one killer of women. I think we're starting to do a better job of getting the word out about that. Um, this was just taken from the paper just about a week or two ago. A new mom who went to the emergency department with crushing chest pain and vomiting and dis dismissed as anxiety, and it was a heart attack. So it gets a lot of press sometimes when this happens. But unfortunately, you know, this is a pretty common phenomenon. I've had a lot of patients uh, with similar stories. And it, you know, it doesn't always end well, unfortunately. So I think awareness is, is, is quite important. So I'm gonna start with a true story. Um, and this is the story of Miss O, who's a 50 year old woman. She saw a woman in a handicapped parking spot who was having trouble getting out of her car and she helped the woman get out. This is just when she was going about her day. Two hours later, she noticed severe aching and soreness in both of her arms and her biceps and in the inner part of her right breast. And she thought, oh, I must have pulled a muscle when I was pulling that woman out of the car. But when she went home, one of her kids said, mom, you look like a ghost. So that, you know, was unusual to her. Uh, later that day with her therapist, she joked that she might be having a heart attack because she was still having these symptoms. When she got home, she was extremely tired. She described it as more tired than I had ever been in my whole life. Just walking up uh, the steps to my bedroom felt like walking up Mount Everest. So this wasn't your usual fatigue that we all have after busy days. She crawled into bed and she fell asleep for three hours. She did go down for, for dinner, but she said she didn't feel like herself. She only ate some crackers. And then she went back upstairs and vomited and noticed she was quite clammy. So then she went on her computer and did what we do in this day and age, right? She Googled heart attack symptoms and she realized she had a lot of them, but she thought, nah, she decided she was just having a panic attack. But she remembered an ad she saw on television and she took four aspirins and then she went to sleep. Uh, 24 hours later, she finally went to her doctor. And as you guys can guess, she was diagnosed with a large myocardial infarction. Um, she had a 99% blockage. So this is Rosie O'Donnell's story. She publicized it. So some of you might've recognized that story, but this is her true story of her heart attack. She did some good things and she did some things that, you know, weren't what we would have recommended. What she did right, she took aspirin but probably maybe she should have chewed the aspirin. She went to her doctor eventually, but she waited 20, more than 24 hours to do so. And she should have called 911. She, at least she knew enough to Google heart attack symptoms, but she didn't actually believe them. So this is not that uncommon among women who I've spoken with. Um, there's a lack of awareness still. Women still think we're, we're getting better at these. The gaps are closing, but I still think that they're more likely to die of breast cancer than heart disease, um, when in reality, they're more, actual, uh, more likely to die from, from heart disease. Um, 10 to four times more likely, in fact, and the American Heart Association is doing a good job starting to get the word out about this. 
Um, so how are women's hearts different than men's? Um, this is just a little cartoon I found. You know, besides the, uh, besides the household differences, there are physiologic differences between men and women. Sorry, I'm playing around with the screen because uh, the video panel is blocking a lot. So give me a second to see if I can figure out how to hide. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know if I can, but okay, I'll keep moving it around. Anyway, um, one of the good things about being a female cardiologist, is, and this is starting to change, but when I go to conferences, it's like the one time that the bathroom line for women is shorter than for men. But thankfully, that's actually starting to change. There's more and more female cardiologists, but you know what? Male cardiologists can, can treat women's heart disease too. Um, you just have to be aware of some of the differences. So women tend to have a slightly higher resting heart rate than men. We have smaller cardiac blood vessels, the epicardial vessels, um, and the hormones do affect some cardiac functions and create some of the challenges. Um, but still our understanding of coronary artery disease in women is lagging behind our understanding in men. And most of our studies apply more to, to men and only somewhat to women. Um, there are some conditions that are completely unique to women. Men don't get them. And there are some conditions that are just more common in women than men. Ones that are obviously unique to women include hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, gestational diabetes, uh, peripartum, dissection, which we'll talk about. And then even women with polycystic ovarian syndrome can have cardiovascular um, sequelae. And then some of the conditions that are just more common in women include coronary vasospasm, which can be associated with migraines and with Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, lupus, which can cause various cardiovascular conditions, including pericarditis and vasculitis. And then spontaneous coronary artery dissection can happen in either sex, but it's, it's much more common in women. Um, now, you know, coronary artery remodeling in women tends to be a little bit different than in men. Uh, in men, the bottom picture is more common. So when we, when, plaque develops in the coronary arteries. Um, it gets this remodeling where uh, it gets narrowing, what we typically think of as stenosis. And that's a phenotype of men or older women. The older a woman is, the more likely she is to present similar to men. But in younger women, um, there's generally still smooth flow and the remodeling is not in, impinging upon the lumen of the coronary artery as, as often. And again, this is an example of positive remodeling uh, seen in men and, and in um, older women. But if we look on intravascular ultrasound or other or techniques, we can see the remodeling that women can have the atherosclerosis they, they can have, whereby the coronary artery, as our, as our cardiologists and physicians know, can look angiographically normal. But when you put an ultrasound probe in the artery, um, it's not always normal. In this example here, uh, the yellow arrow versus the reddish orange arrow on an angiogram, they look similar caliber. But when we look inside the vessel wall and, and to read this intravascular ultrasound or IVUS, this central circle is the catheter. But both of these show a 3.1 millimeter lumen. However, in the, in the uh, top image, you can see all this crescent amount of plaque that's lurking there. And in the bottom image, it's a truly normal image. So even though they look the same, there's a lot of atherosclerosis hiding behind the scenes uh, that can cause problems. So compared with men of similar ages, women's, women tend to have less obstructive coronary artery disease despite an equivalent ischemic burden. In other words, similar, uh, if you take women and a man with a cardiovascular event, the man is more likely to have an obstruction. And I'll show you some of the data about that in a little bit. Younger women with an acute coronary syndrome, they tend to have more plaque erosion and distal embolization, and men tend to have more plaque explosion and acute thrombosis, so big vessel occlusion, whereas women, it might be uh, embolized down to the small vasculature. I think it's worth talking for at least a minute about SCAD, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. This could be a whole lecture in and of itself, um, but the reason I think it's important for everyone to know about in the emergency medical field, not just the cardiologists, are, is because it can present uh, in young women. And so if you're 
uh, out on an ambulance run and it's a 20 something year old woman complaining of what sounds like STEMI like symptoms, but you look at her and she's 20 and she's fit and you think, oh, this is a panic attack. There's no way. Well, this is one diagnosis that's actually quite common in that age group. So I, I think it's, it's worth knowing about. 90% of patients uh, with SCAD are women. Usually it's between the ages of 47 and 53, but it's also common in the, in the pregnancy years and in the peripartum period. And these patients tend to have way less of your typical risk factors than men or than your typical MI patient. It only accounts for you know, under 1% of heart attacks, but in women under 50, it accounts for up to 33% of them. And 20% 20 20 of the uh, MIs during pregnancy are SCAD. Um, so there's several tri triggers to be aware of, emotional stress, physical stress, such as a hard valsalva or exertion. Um, I've had patients who get this on spin bikes and things like that. Um, hormones can do it and illicit drugs as well. And five to 8% may have concomitant connective tissue disease, things like Marfan's, Ehlers-Danlos, Lloyd Dietz, um, or many will have fibromuscular dysplasia as well. And if they have fibromuscular dysplasia, then you see abnormalities in the non-coronary arteries. It's quite common. Um, including cerebral aneurysms. And I'll show you some examples of that as well um, in a little bit. Oops. So there are different classifications of SCAD. And I don't know that we need to kind of delve into this too deeply right now, but since we do have a lot of uh, medical, uh, per, everyone's medical on the, on the call, but cardiologists, um, just a little reminder, if there's a tear of the intima and you have a flap, that's a type one SCAD. Um, type two is the most common. That's where there's an intramural hematoma. And it's either 2A, if it's flanked by normal artery on both sides, like in this example, whereas if it goes all the way to the end of the vessel, that's called type 2B. Um, type three is, is, um, is the least common type. It's similar to type two, but just shorter, less than two centimeters. And then type four is a complete occlusion. That can be challenging to notice because it's not like a complete occlusion of a major epicardial vessel. Sometimes it could be, it could be a branch and it could be hard, harder to notice. Um, and it can, if, if you, uh, this type three is also a little bit challenging. It can mimic atherosclerosis since it's a shorter lesion that might get mistaken for a typical plaque. But one of the clues is if the other vessels are pristine, um, you might wanna consider this. Or if you see a lot of tortuous vessels, um, a lot of times, you'll need to give nitroglycerin intracoronary to rule out vasospasm, but this is an atherosclerosis mimic. And here's a couple of clinical examples of SCAD. Um, um, this, this one on top here, labeled A, was a 70-year-old woman who prevented, presented with acute MI and VFib arrest. She ended up having SCAD of the OM, which you can see here. And, when, and, and I think I mentioned a lot of these have uh, concomitant extra cardiac, extra coronary disease. So we typically want to scan, do a pan scan, CT scans of the vasculature after this diagnosis. And this woman indeed had a celiac artery dissection, you can see here, and she had fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, here you can see it in the left uh, external iliac. This next one on the second row was a 57-year-old woman who had an end STEMI, and she ended up having SCAD of her obtuse marginal. You can see it's kind of a lumpy, bumpy appearance right here. And then her right external iliac and right renal arteries also showed um, this, this, the, the signs that are characteristic of fibromuscular dysplasia, their aneurysmal uh, and beating. So that's the, the FMD. This third one was a younger woman, 35 year old, who presented two weeks after delivering her fourth child. So it doesn't happen with every child, thankfully, but on her fourth one, she developed SCAD here, you can see of the LAD. Um, and she also had over here uh, a dissection. At this happened 10 years prior, she had had a dissection of her left internal carotid artery. Um, so when she was only 25. And finally, a um, 47 year old woman who presented with a STEMI, and hers was a type four SCAD. It was a complete occlusion of this LAD. She also had FMD of the renals 
the external iliacs, carotids, and vertebrals. And she ended up on her uh, and her on her angiogram here. You can see she had a six and a half millimeter uh, aneurysm in her left internal carotid artery. So a lot of concomitant diagnoses um, in these women. Um, but that's not the uh, that's not the only mechanism. Takotsubo is more common in women and can cause severe uh, strokes and arrhythmias. But there's also problems with um, impaired coronary activity or what we call microcirculatory dysfunction as well. Um, so if you don't see any obstructive coronary disease or even or SCAD, some of these things do represent unique targets of therapy. So vasospasm, autonomic imbalance, endothelial dysfunction. There's also uh, increased thrombophilia and sometimes aspirin resistance in women. So that's something to be aware of. Now, I mentioned before that compared with men of the same age, women have less obstruction in their coronary arteries uh, despite equivalent event rates. And, and, and that does present some unique targets. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, the study that I wanted to point out, which shows this, um, there's a couple, but one nice one early on from the 70s was the CAST study. And I think it shows why we don't necessarily want to extrapolate to women all the techniques and um, treatments that we've developed in men. Um, so the CAST study is quite old now. It was big, though. It was 25,000 patients referred for CAST. It was only about a quarter were women, but even so, that's still the largest cohort of women with angiography that we have. And so even back then we had some lessons from CAST. Um, women are about five times as likely to have a false positive stress test. So that's important to remember. We'll look at, we'll look at the numbers there a little bit later. There's also a high proportion of women who have what sounds like typical angina, but no visible blockages, blockages on angiography. This is the first time that was really shown well. And then even the traditional risk factors seem to be less predictive in women. So this is what I was talking about, stress tests. Um, if you look at patients with definite angina men versus women, the percent with false positive stress tests are higher. If you look with probable angina, same thing, and non-ischemic chest pain, um, same thing. So regardless of whether it turns out to be, you know, with how good the symptoms sound or how non-ischemic the chest pain is, um, women are more likely to have a false positive. Um, let's see. Now, I do wanna bring up one point that because this was kind of an older study from the 70s and initially the way they determined it was a false positive was by doing the angiogram. And if you don't see a blockage, they say, okay, well, you had definite angina it's, you know, chest pain radiating down your arm, but it's a false positive. So I want to raise the question, is it really a false positive? And from what we know now about women, I think we have perhaps a different answer for that. Um, stress tests in general perform worse for diagnosing obstruction in women, but they're still very good for prognosis. So if a woman has a, quote, false positive stress test, even if she doesn't have blockages in the epicardial vessels on her coronary angiogram, she has a worse prognosis than men over the next two to five years. So there's some sort of disconnect between obstructive disease burden and risk of ischemia, specifically in women. Now we finally got some answers and kind of shown this data um, more recently from things like the WISE study and the Women Take Heart Project. So the WISE study is especially is a great one. It was multi-center and it was about a thousand patients um, with chest pain who had been referred for angiography and they followed them up for five years. All these women had chest pain and had to be referred uh, during the clinical course. So either positive stress test or very high pre-test probability according to their doctor. A third of them ended up having normal coronary angiograms. Now among the rest, you know, 24% had coronary disease, but it was non-obstructive, so not significant enough uh, to cause a hemodynamically significant lesion. And 42% had a significant uh, stenosis. Um, we're gonna compare this to the Women Take Heart study. And this was asymptomatic women volunteers, so a comparison group. 
um, followed for 10 years, but they had good risk factor assessment. They had to have a negative ETT so they, and EKG. So they had to be relatively healthy. So remember that group. When we look at these uh, studies, the women in the Y study, again, these are ones with a chest pain syndrome of some sort referred for cath. Um, the five-year event rate in the women, even with non-obstructive coronaries, was higher than if they're normal coronary, than if they have normal coronary arteries. But the important point here is compare that to age and race match group um, without symptoms, only 2.4%. So among these women who got referred for cath but had quote, normal coronary arteries, they were almost four times as likely to have an event over the next five years compared to healthy, truly healthy women. So even normal coronary arteries in these women may not be normal. Women with these symptoms, but no obstructive coronary disease are still at increased risk of events compared with asymptomatic women. Now this shows some of the data. Um, group one in the lightest color are those healthy controls. Group two in the gray here are the groups of women referred for cath because of symptoms, but they have normal coronary angiograms. And group three are the ones with you know, not normal, but no significant obstruction. And you can see that across the range of number of risk factors, regardless, even if these women have no risk factors, if they're referred for a cath for symptoms, um, they have twice as high of a risk as an asymptomatic woman. And this holds true across age groups. So it's true even in young women here at the bottom, and it's true um, to, to some degree, you know, I, I guess I'll point out in the oldest women, with non-obstructive disease, they did similarly to their age mask controls. But still, if you had a non-obstructive uh, pattern, uh, those folks still did the worst, even at the older ages. Um, so the here, this is an example in some other studies over the years of how often we see normal and how often we see non-obstructive coronary disease in these event-triggered studies. What do I mean by that? These studies were studies of ACS patients, either unstable angina uh, or myocardial infarction. And when you look at women compared to men, women were way more likely in all of these event-triggered studies to have normal or non-obstructive CAD compared to men. Um, you know, and that goes holds all the way through, uh, all the way true, all the way down through STEMIs. Even women with STEMIs, 10% of them um, can have non-obstructive caths. So what does that tell us? Well, for one thing, I, tell, I think it just tells us women are a lot more complex than men, but there's a lot, you know, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. I'm gonna share two uh, quick, quick hit cases of patients of mine um, from the past few years. Um, the first was a 46 year old with no cardiac risk factors and she developed chest pain after a spin class. Her ECG had just mild kind of non-diagnostic, non-specific ST changes. This was um, prior to switching to the high sensitivity troponin, but her first one was undetectable. And then it bumped up um, within a few hours. So she was diagnosed with MI. We got an echo and it showed overall normal function, um, but some sluggish wall motion at the tip of the heart. So we did take her for coronary angiography. Let's see if it runs here. So um, this, I think I first put on just an example of a of her course. And what you notice is just very sluggish filling um, and very tortuous vessels. But if I pause it also, uh, you know, in some of these vessels, you can kind of see a little bit of the appearance, kind of like SCAD. It's hard to say, and you can't, of course, get an IVUS down this far, but, um, but I think the most prominent feature here is the sluggish filling. And for those of us who aren't as used to looking at coronary angiograms, here's, you know, normal filling. It should really just flow very quickly. All right. So, we see this a lot in women, men can have it as well. Um, but a lot of times that represents 
you know, it could be some SCAD, but more likely since the, the filling is slow everywhere, microvascular disease. The off-ramps are backed up. And so the main freeway, the epicardial vessels tend to have sluggish flow as well. Here's a second quick hit case. This is a 59 year old woman. She's an attorney. She has a history of migraines, but no cardiac risk factors. She's um, extremely healthy, also exercises regularly. She started getting back and shoulder blade pain after her usual aerobics routine. It happened again the next day. So she came in, her ECG was unremarkable and her initial troponin was, was significantly elevated. So we took her for an angiogram as well. And her filling's a little better, but you can see she also has these tortuous vessels, twisty and curvy. And I think you can see either an embolic or a SCAD type event uh, right here. Okay, so these are kind of two examples that we see um, on these types of things, not uncommonly. Um, a quick word about diagnosis of MI in women. I know there's a lot of emergency docs here as well. Um, a lot of hospitals around the county I would say most are now using high sensitivity troponin. Um, it's important to know that regardless of which cut point your hospital uses, uh, women do have lower cut points than men. If you do healthy women compared to healthy men, women's troponins run lower. Um, so as an example, um, if you're using the Roche, if you're using troponin T, it's always the Roche assay and it has these cut points here. If your hospital is using a single cut point, it might be listed as 19. But understand that really the cut point is a little bit higher in men, 22, and a little bit lower in women, 14. That's the, that's the true 99 percentile value where 99% of healthy women should have a troponin less than 14. The limit of detection, by the way, uh, for the United States here is six. So, in older women, it probably doesn't matter as much because when they have their heart attacks, there's more obstruction, bigger MIs, they have more comorbidities, and they probably are able to mount a troponin over 19. But I would say if you have a young woman with chest pain that sounds concerning and her troponin is between 14 and 19, that's not normal. And, and I would take that seriously, especially in younger women. Um, the outcome of women with elevated troponin and acute MI is interesting. Um, it turns out the outcome is a little bit worse in these women, now this troponin I, so I switched it on you here. The cut points are different, but those women with the in-between, obviously if you have a low troponin concentration, they do the best. And if you have a really high troponin concentration, they don't do so well. But why would women with troponin in this middle range, at least in this particular study, um, do worse in terms of uh, survival or recurrent MI. And I think it's because um, there, there's misdiagnoses going on there. Um, a lot of times those troponins are blown off. It could also be comorbidities, kidney disease, and heart failure can have you living with troponins in, in that range sometimes, but a lot of times we miss it. I get asked a lot, you know, do women have different symptoms with our heart attacks than men? And um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a nuanced answer. Um, there's a lot of differences between women and men, as I mentioned. It turns out most women probably do have chest discomfort and a similar presentation. However, um, and, the, and the number of women with no chest pain at all is similar to men, which can happen up to a third of the time. But even though most women have chest pain and most studies have shown that, it's women more frequently will have either associated atypical symptoms or sometimes just atypical symptoms. And more women than men report multiple symptoms. And the chest pain may not be the most prominent feature uh, in women. So some of the atypical heart attack symptoms, kind of like the Rosie O'Donnell story, unusual fatigue. And at first when I tell women, oh, fatigue can be a sign and they get all nervous, oh, I'm tired all the time. But so I think I like to point out, I'm not just talking about your regular tired, profound fatigue, as if the flight of stairs feels like Mount Everest, right? So, and something that is completely unusual for you. Um, sleep disturbances. A lot of people have sleep disturbances. They're not always, they're usually not heart attacks. Shortness of breath, indigestion and nausea, anxiety, back, shoulder, arm or jaw pain, 
And even dizziness or weakness in women, especially with some of the other symptoms um, can be a trigger. And in one study, almost 80% of women reporting having at least one of these symptoms more than a month before her heart attack. So there's warning signs that women are ignoring. And in this study, only 30% reported chest pain. But I think I mentioned most studies show that most women at least have some chest pain. Um, what about risk factors? Do they differ between women and men? Some do. There are modifiable and unmodifiable risk factors, right? We can't change the ones on the right, but we can affect the ones on the left. Um, men and women have these risk factors, but there's some risk factors that may be unique to women. We're working on a study now looking at breast arterial calcification. Women get mammograms and many women get them every single year. And if some, just like we use coronary artery calcium for risk stratification, uh, there's some data to suggest we might be able to use breast arterial calcification uh, to predict cardiovascular risk. So this is something uh, that's a work in process. And so you can imagine you can screen not just for breast cancer, but also cardiovascular disease risk. And if you see it, it could be something that might maybe helps us um, get women more engaged in their lifestyle changes and, and improve their outcomes potentially down the line. Family history as a risk factor um, is still a good one to always ask about and just be aware if it's a male relative, technically it's only considered a positive family history if, it, if the man had their heart disease before age 55. In women, it's before age 65, it's still considered a family history that confers a risk factor. And again, anytime there's like a strict cutoff like that, I like to take it with a grain of salt. It's not like the day you turn 55, you know, oh, now it's no longer a risk factor if, if your dad it was a day after 55 versus the day before. So there's some wiggle room there, but that's a guideline. Um, I wonder if anyone recognizes this guy. This is before, and this is more recently. That's our ex-governor. This is now, even the now is now probably five to 10 years old. But ob obesity is definitely a risk factor in both men and in women. This is from the uh, fair, which I think will be back in force this year, the San Diego County Fair. I took this picture a while ago. They had to change the name. If, no, if you go, they still have this booth, but it's not called Heart Attack Cafe anymore. Um, luckily, I got this picture before then. And I actually asked them, why did you change the name? And what happened was they were at a fair in Las Vegas and someone was eating their delicious, healthy foods here. And actually right in front of the uh, stand was on the ground clutching their heart. So everyone was taking pictures and like thinking, oh, look how funny this is. Well, the guy was really having a heart attack and ended up suing them. So they had to change the name. Um, so things like this, the coronary combo, that's what keeps us all in business, right? Um, so obesity and diabetes are huge risk factors for men and women. But what you might not realize is that um, in women, you know, age, age for age, it's actually a much bigger risk factor uh, than in men. Exercise and activity. This is um, kind of a famous picture now. It's everyone at the conference, the cardiology conference, taking the elevator instead of the stairs. And now they have something called elevator or escalator shaming, where if they catch you taking the escalator, they have people snapping photos. And next thing you know, you're on Twitter with the hashtag escalator shaming. So now everyone at uh, the heart meetings tries to take the stairs. Um, and smoking, smoking is obviously a risk factor in women and in men. This one got not one, but two cigarettes because women are good at multitasking, right? And I just thought this was from the New England Journal a while back I found um, linking tobacco use with lung cancer. So it's not just the heart, but and here's the cigarette pack that she forgot to take out of, uh, or he forgot to take out of his pocket before the CT scan. But why do I bring up smoking and talk about women? Um, smoking is associated with half of all coronary events in women, even though smoking, um, is much less today than it was you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. So even with minimal use, uh, the increases, there's an increased risk in women. Um, and there's some data that it's, it's a higher risk in women than in men. So the big smokers over 40 cigarettes a day, the risk rises to 75X. So 
So that's one reason. So especially women smokers, it doesn't take quite as much smoking to get to high risk levels. Blood pressure, also a risk in men and in women. The increased risk in women, in fact, as we know from recent trials, uh, starts at a blood pressure over 120, over 80. And we know that from the Framingham cohort, as well as a lot of newer studies. So optimal is still 120 over 80. And the more recent blood pressure classifications reflect that. Now we call normal uh, under 12080. Um, we used to call it free hypertension if they were in the 120s, and now we call it elevated. Um, so with each doubling of your blood pressure, with each 20 to 10 millimeter increase in blood pressure, your mortality risk doubles. But again, why do I bring that up in this talk? You know, we have a really poor control of blood pressure in women. Um, only about half are treated and only about a quarter are controlled. Again, maybe getting a little bit better, although historically the trend has not been good. Some unique risk factors uh, in women, um, eclampsia, depression, stress. I mean, stress isn't unique to women, but um, uh, some isolation, especially with COVID. And then I mentioned Takotsubo a little bit earlier. Um, Stress-induced cardiomyopathy is more common in women than in men and is a true phenomenon that can be a STEMI mimic. You get elevated troponins, you can get ST elevations, um, and it can cause real morbidity and mortality. Uh, how can we prevent heart disease? This is, um, I, think, <laughs> I think one of my patients sent me this picture. I think he was just trying to uh, trigger me because it was cheeseburger in Krispy Kreme donuts. So, you know, what with a beer to wash it all down. So what not to do? Um, you know, it's a changing paradigm. We know that atherosclerosis is a diffuse disease. So even though we stent focal regions, we have to treat the whole lifestyle and appropriate treat treatment, you know, involves reducing global risk. Um, not just the risk factors, not just the blood pressure, cholesterol, but the whole thing, heart healthy diet, the stress. Um, and we have to begin treatment early because we know that disease can occur early. It can, we start to build up plaque even in our twenties. We know that from studies, autopsy studies of motor vehicle accidents and soldiers and things like that. Um, the prevalence of atherosclerotic plaque in young people, like I said, it's not zero even among teenagers. Um, and the older you get, um, especially in the coronary arteries, the more people already have atherosclerotic plaque building up. So of course, if you have risk factors, statins are the way to go. And the good news in women is that they do tend to be more effective. Um, a lot of studies have shown that things like pravastatin compared to placebo are much more effective and they're still effective in men, but women seem to get a bigger bang for their buck. So there are things we can do. Um, sometimes I get asked, you know, I'm a a lot of my research is in biomarkers. I get asked about screening blood tests. Can you use troponin and BNP to screen for risk? And there is some data coming out that, that that's, uh, that's doable. And there are, like I said, slightly different cut points in women and men. I don't think it's, it's not guideline based at this time. CRP gained a lot of traction 10, 20 years ago, um, but I give a little bit of caution with that. Um, there's no clear cause and effect relationship between inflammation this, as reflected by CRP and future risk. Um, it's, there's a lot of nonspecific causes of elevation, infection, inflammation. We do know that people with longstanding inflammation, whether from uh, vasculitis, connective tissue disease, or even gum disease, do have an increased risk down the line though. Um, but a lot of established cardiovascular risk factors also increase CRP levels. So treating those is probably the more efficacious way. But again, this is an evolving field and things like colchicine and anti-inflammatory agents, um, there's, the trials are starting to show that they do have cardiovascular benefit sometimes um, at the expense of, of higher risks of mortality in, in other arenas though. Um, so in conclusion, I think, Risk of cardiovascular disease, unfortunately, still goes underappreciated and underdiagnosed. Um, we miss prevention as well. A lot of the cardiovascular risk factors are the same, but some of them are weighted stronger in women. And the symptomatic presentation is generally similar, 
but there are some differences and atypical features can be more prominent in women. It's incumbent upon us as physicians, nurses, uh, medics to, to be able to recognize that and take it seriously, even if it's a young woman, because especially in young women, the pathophysiology of the acute coronary syndrome that they might get can be, can be different. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to have a discussion or, or take questions.